Welcome to The Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton, and I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with the Shadow Industrial Relations Minister, the Honourable Tony Burke. Tony, thank you for joining this conversation. How are you today? Yeah, doing pretty well. Doing pretty well, although I, I, I'm not a natural isolator, so as restrictions are gradually being lifted, um, I'm, I'm getting better and better. Good to hear. Well, look, when it comes to the arts and entertainment sector, it's your voice that seems to cut through the noise. So what is it about the industry? What's your background with it? And what is the importance of the music industry to you? Um, look, I'm not an artist. I'm, I'm someone who, who loves what artists do. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I travel with a guitar. I still have a piano lesson once a week. Um, but... Love it. I, I, I don't pretend for a minute um, <laughs> that for me it's more than a hobby and a love. And when you see somebody who has really mastered a craft and can, is not just delivering the technical capacity but just is deliver, injecting so much of their soul into it, oh my goodness. Uh, it's, it's something that, that reaches you. Uh, yeah. And and it's where, you know, we always sort of group together arts and entertainment, but neither word does it justice. No. Neither word does it justice. And for me, the thing is, uh, and why I, I particularly love live performance and, and always have, is that, um, that sense that you're, affecting, you're effectively allowing someone and giving them permission to lead you through a journey of emotion or story or whatever they choose. You're basically handing that bit over, and you know the um, a, a good writer will take you on that roller coaster every, as you turn each page. Uh, a, a good actor will take you through a journey as you um, during the course of a performance. A, a musician can change your mood at the first bar, yeah, yeah, uh, and or a visual artist at the first glance, and that's something that, yeah. We're not good in Australia at valuing that sort of connection, but, you know, it's something that we, in fact, rely on and live with every day, and if it's not there, we miss it terribly. That's right. During this crisis, I guess, we've been forced to confront uh, that you can't take this for granted because while for most of us it's a moment of, of reaching for something more, to have that always available, we need people where it's their job. Exactly. And, and we, I think we've, one thing where I think I've historically failed a bit is I've, I've been really focused on talking about how our artists tell our stories and how our musicians provide the soundtrack to life in Australia. Yeah. And we probably haven't spent enough time reminding people that we're also talking about workers. Uh, we're exactly. talking about people who need to pay the bills, otherwise they can't keep producing what we need from them, what we need them to be producing. And I think we've, we've really had to confront that in the most awful way these last few months. And with, what do you think, what's your take on the current state of the whole events and music industry? I mean, what are you hearing in terms of real-time data, financial losses due to the lockdown impact? And more importantly, what do you believe is a possible recovery roadmap for the very, like, you know, the, the hundreds of millions, of hundreds of thousands of men and women who are just ordinary everyday people with small businesses, families, mortgages, their livelihoods have been impacted by this. So what's your current take on that? Uh, well, the first thing we've got to remember with all of this is this isn't like any other downturn. Normally, if there's an economic downturn in Australia or all, all the way around the world, the first businesses to hit the fence are businesses that already structurally weren't as strong. Right. What's happening at the moment is businesses that were completely strong, completely viable, completely commercial, are hitting the wall not because there was anything wrong with the business but because there's new public health rules that won't last but that are there at the moment for a good reason. And that means I think we've got to handle things differently to how we would in any other downturn because the job isn't to sort of weed out the non-commercial uh, operators and then you know, start afresh. The job is to try to make sure that any business that was viable were it not for coronavirus is still there and ready to employ people and 
and open their doors to audiences as soon as the restrictions are lifted. And that leads you to, to very different policies to what you'd normally consider. Now, I've been, I've been pretty open-minded with the government about, you know, you do something for this sector, and you know, I've started to get to the point of saying, you do anything for this sector, we'll welcome it. You know, yes. we're, we're not wanting to bag you. We, you know, there won't be an election between now and when you make the decision, so just do something good here and we'll welcome it. And if there's areas where you could go further, we'll talk about those too, but you're not going to get bagged for doing something. So we've, we've left it as open as we can. Uh, and there are different ways and, you know, there's so many different aspects and sectors for the industry. And the, I'll say the state governments have been doing a pretty good job around the country, uh, picking, up, picking up some of the pace. Uh, a lot of what they've done, some of it has been good for artists. A lot of it uh, hasn't opened up the same opportunities for technical crew or road crew or, right. or people like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, effectively what you want to do and what we should have done as soon as the shutters came down on large gatherings. Mm -hmm. We should have had policies in place where the intention was to press the pause button with the knowledge that when restrictions were lifted, you were going to want to print play again, uh, press play again. That's, that's what you wanted to do. Uh, now, we didn't do that, and a whole lot of people are hitting hardship that, they, that need not have occurred. Um, but if the government's going to come to it late, that what matters is we don't need to be creating new events. We don't need to be creating uh, a whole new infrastructure or brand new thing. What we need to make sure of is events that would be commercial were it not for coronavirus, we need to look at those and say, okay, what, are we, what can we do to let that still take place with whatever the restrictions will be? And if you do it that way, then as much as possible in 12 months' time, the infrastructure for the festivals, for the events, uh, for the venues is still there. Because my fear is if you, if you don't look at... Like I used to hold the environment portfolio at the same time, which always made sense because they're both about ecology. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even if you did everything right only for artists at the moment, it's no help if at the end of the year the restrictions go and, there, and we don't have venues. Exactly. So you, you need to just approach every aspect of policy with we've pressed pause, what do we need to make sure that when it's time to get going again and we press play, everything still works. And I think if you think of it in those terms, there's a few different ways they can handle it, but all of those, all the different methods will give us the same destination, which is what we want. Right, so associations and peak bodies in these industries what do you recommend they can do to actually get the real needs through to the government because obviously job keeper if that's not extended that's going to have a pretty devastating effect when we get to october so what can our peak bodies do to actually get that message across so that they know exactly what our needs are um back each other in it's really important at the moment for peak bodies that we don't have and that we haven't um, but it's really important. Sometimes sectors turn in against each other. Mm -hmm. We yeah. mustn't let that happen. And the unity that's been there so far, you know, because, yeah, you've got some organisations that are effective employee organisations, some that are effective employer organisations. You've got different bodies out there. Keep the unity. The unity is critically important. Uh, and every possibility there is to make noise right now we're at the point right now when the government is saying they're going to do something. Now, yeah, we've went for months where they said they were going to do nothing. So to get to, even though they haven't done much, to say where they say they're going to announce something, now is the time to make as much noise as possible. Uh, we couldn't have had a better time for the parliamentary webpage to have an official petition going for the sector. Yes. Um, and that's edging up towards 35,000 now. It's a the biggest one on the page at the moment, I think. Um, so we just, everything we can do that promotes extra volume, um, you yeah, know, pretend it's the main stage, I guess, at a, at a festival. Exactly. Um, <laughs> everything we can do that cranks up the volume right now will help because once they've made the announcement, whatever it is, it's going to be harder still to get them to do any more than that. 
So now's the time to just maximise the unity and the volume. Well, everyone, you've heard that's our call for action. Tony's given us a pretty clear action of what we need to do. Tony, it's been a great pleasure to speak to you, to have your voice in this conversation. And we thank you so much for your support. It means the world to us. And we look forward to speaking to you again sometime in the future. Thank you and so thanks, much. Thanks, And thanks for what you do. Thanks, Tony. See you next time. Yeah.